tabernacle, President Kimball addressed the conference. I feel grateful to my Father in Heaven that my life has been preserved, and the lives of my brethren, to behold the day we now see, and enjoy the blessings we now enjoy. As President Young has often observed, we are blessed above all the inhabitants of the earth. That is true to my certain knowledge. I have been a member of this church twenty-two years, and have never seen the day to equal the one I now see, for prosperity and for the comforts of life, with a very few exceptions. I enjoy all the comforts of life I ever enjoyed at any period of my life, and I have lived in a fruitful country generally until I became a Mormon, and part of that time I have lived where the luxuries of life have been abundant. As for this country being fruitful and qualified to produce all the things that we need for our comfort, it is not behind any in any part of the earth that ever I was in, and I have visited many parts of it. All that the soil requires in these regions is cultivation, and it will make us as comfortable as to the necessaries of life as any people ever was upon the earth. I have often said, and say it again, if we live up to our profession, be faithful to our religion, and take a course to be subject to the government of God, to those who are appointed to lead this people, you never need be troubled with frost, cold, and with changes that are common to this country, and every other country, because I know the faith, the virtue, the integrity, and the course that this people will take, viz., to be true to their God, and true to Him they have acknowledged to be their head, their governor, their president, their prophet, their priest, and their king. If you take this course, the elements will change, and the nature of things not only in this valley, but among the nations of the earth, for the earth will be revolutionized through the faithfulness of the saints. This I know. Perhaps some of you do not believe this statement, but I do. For instance, you may refer to one place in the Book of Mormon where the servants of God assembled together, and prayed for the nations in which they lived, and for those that were at war against them, and then and they prevailed, and their enemies became their friends and associates. The faithfulness and prayers of the saints of God changed the nature of things, not only religiously, but politically, and the government was afterwards administered in peace. Will it not have the same effect with us? It is verily true to my certain knowledge it will have. And if this people, taking them as a people that profess to be L.D. saints, would take the course some men take, and have taken from the beginning, there would be five thousand men and women added to this church, where there is but one at this day. And it would bring to pass the works of God with more power, and the Holy Ghost would wait upon the elders, and upon the saints abroad with tenfold more power than it does now. This I know. I see the work of God is prospering and rolling forth from nation to nation in the old world. It has gone from the shores of Europe into almost every nation. The very moment the elders put the leaven, as it were, in the measure of meal, it at once begins to work, and it is quicker and lighter, and soon elevated to the surface than it was in the beginning. It catches at once and begins to leaven, and go from that nation to another nation, until all the nations of the earth will soon hear the sound of the glorious gospel. It will take but a few years to accomplish this design, and then the Lord has said the end shall come. The end of something will come, I assure you, and there will be an overturn which will make things very different from now. Well, you that have come here from England, from the United States, from Germany, from Italy, from Norway, from Sweden, from China, and from the islands of the sea, for what purpose have you come? You came to serve your God, by keeping His commandments and to listen to the counsel of those you have acknowledged to be your head. I will tell you one thing, brethren, it is something very contrary to your fallen nature to become subject. In the world from whence you have come, and where you have been taught, men seek to become independent one of another. This is universally so, according to my knowledge and experience. From the time that God called Joseph Smith to act in his position and calling, he gave him revelations for the guidance of this people, and the very first elders of this church, when they went forth to preach the gospel and baptize the people. The next thing was to gather together all those that were disposed to sacrifice, and covenant with me, saith the Lord. In my experience, since I have been a member in this church, I have seen a great deal of murmuring and complaining, and a great many tears, and much sorrow and lamentation, and thousands upon thousands turn away from the faith. Even brethren and sisters that I loved as I love my own family, they have turned away, and perhaps because somebody took an advantage of them. Suppose you should all turn away from the faith. What has that to do with me? Suppose you should all act like devils. What is that to me? What has it to do with my religion? I am to serve God and keep His commandments. 
perfectly independently of the acts of any other person in God's world. They have nothing to do with me, neither one way nor the other, so far as serving my God as an individual is concerned. But it is for me and you to serve God and keep His commandments and fulfill His covenants. When we went into the waters of baptism, we made a covenant to forsake the world and cleave unto the Lord God with all our hearts all the rest of our days. This is the covenant that I made, and it is the covenant that each of you made, or if you did not, you should have done. Now will you falsify that covenant? There are a great many who will fulfill it. Yea, I will not make a single exception, for God has determined that every man shall fulfill it. For if they do not in this probation, they will have to do it in another, and if not in that, in another. When man commences to hoe his row of corn, he has got to finish it. If he don't hoe but five hills, and then leaves it, he will have to go back and hoe that row out. And if you skip a single hill, you will have to go back and hoe that hill. I am speaking by the principle of comparison, and using a figure that all your farmers can understand. I speak of these things by way of instruction, and to remind you of the duties and obligations you are under. I say to the people who compose this congregation today, please go to England, or to Denmark, to Italy, or to anywhere else in the world, and can you find a congregation of people that look better than this, either in their looks, clothing, or other comforts of life? I have lived in the United States, in one of the best lands there is in the world. It is called that promised land, but I have never seen as comfortable times as I see now. I never saw them any better than I see them today. I never say the people is a general thing, as well as this people are. You think you have made a sacrifice in leaving your homes, your fathers, your mothers, your brothers and sisters, your farms and fine dwellings. I have left all these, such as I had. Is this any sacrifice? No. I have told you often that I thanked God when I escaped from my kindred, and I have never seen the day since I left them that I wanted to go back to them, though I did go back once to visit them. And when I went into their houses, I felt as though there was a legion of devils in every house I went into. They were opposed to me, to my religion, and to my brethren. I was thankful when I got away from them, and I suppose they are as good a people as your kindred are. This is called a sacrifice to the most part of you, but it is none to me. You think you have sorrow and trouble, many of you, because you have to live in wagons and tents. I speak of those who have just come in off the plains, who are still living in their wagons with not much to eat. President Young, myself, and 140 others have been here, and we were in our wagons, and nothing to eat in our wagons, and nothing to eat in the country, except it was crickets. When we got to Green River, making our way to this land, we had to break the road, for there was not a track or trace for 700 miles through a wild country full of Indians, in which we were perfect strangers. When we were on the Platte River, one half of our men were out of food. They had no provisions at all and no one in the valley to bring out flour or teams or wagons or potatoes, and everything this valley now produces to us. We had no person to extend the hand of benevolence and kindness to us, and notwithstanding this, we did not murmur. I never saw a man cry once or shed a tear in the whole camp. We had one man who was appointed general murmurer, and no man was allowed to murmur, only that one person. You would think that you had awful trials if you could not have a chance to murmur, but we placed it all upon one man, and if there were two that murmured, the greatest murmurer was appointed boss murmurer. That is recorded, and will come out in its place in the church history by and by. Supposing we should come to the same conclusion here, to appoint a general murmurer in every ward, to do all the murmuring, and let that person be the one that complains the most, and then follow out the same order among the females, and that female who tells the most lies, and murmurs the most, we would have appointed as queen murmurer, or queen grumbler, which you please. It is true that you have come out of nations of different habits and customs, and many of you live in wagons, and I am glad of it. I lived in a wagon for more than three years after I came into this valley. I had not a house big enough to get into to sleep until the brethren started on their mission to Denmark. President Young was in the same situation. As to your trials, your tribulations, your perplexities, your fatigue, and all this, I say I am glad of it. I thank God for it, because it is salvation for you. It is as good for you to have an experience as it is for President Young and myself and other men. We did not murmur when we found this country, nor became discouraged in the least, but we were thankful that our lives were preserved, and if our wagons and teams had been taken from us and our lives had been preserved, we would have been thankful. Yes, more than this people are now for every blessing they enjoy. Why? Because a man will give all he has for his life when he is brought to that extremity, which he proves he ought to be more thankful for that blessing 
than for all things in the world, to hear people who are in good houses and have the comforts of life in abundance around them, and have so much clothing that they are scarcely have a place to put it, I say to hear them murmur and complain there is nothing in this world that makes me feel more indignant. I feel as God feels when he looks upon the human family and sees their unthankfulness for all the blessings he bestows upon them. You know it is so. You are not thankful. You do not appreciate the blessings committed to you, and I know it. It is not in your family only, nor in mine alone, but it is found in every family more or less. When I reflect and see how kind the Lord has been to us in preserving our lives and bringing us safely to this goodly land through the instrumentality of his servant Brigham, where we can have the privilege of possessing a piece of land without money and without price, and our wood in the same manner, and thousands of other things that cost us nothing but trouble of getting it, my heart is filled with praise. Everything here is free. The air and the land is free. Our food is free. And everything we have is free. I know you think you have hard times and small wages, but let me refer you to one man here, which you will all know. He is our master singer. I have stayed in his house many days and nights in old England when I first went there, and he would weave twenty-five and thirty yards of sheeting in a day, the same kind that we buy here and only get eighteen pence for his day's labor. Besides having to go seven miles for the web, and then carrying the cloth seven miles back again, is not that true, Brother James Smithies? Yes. And his wife had to work in the same way. They had to run their shuttles from morning until night, and from Monday morning until Saturday, and we just have time to take the cloth home and get a little oatmeal to live upon. I have sat down with them many times, and perhaps all I had at a meal was one or two spoonfuls of oatmeal, and thought I was doing first rate. I speak of Brother James as one person to represent many, and he will take no exceptions because I refer to him. He knows I am telling the truth. There are thousands in the same situation, and yet the brethren, who have been delivered from that state of toil and comparative starvation, and placed in a condition wherein they may soon take themselves wealthy, as to this world's goods, will murmur and complain of their sufferings, and against those who have paid their passage to this place and delivered them from bondage. Brother James was not brought here. He came with his own means through the blessing of the Lord, for the Lord opened the way for him to come here. Did I ever hear him murmur in my life? No, never, nor any other man has ever heard him, and I wish to God every other person would follow his example. I have seen the time that I have lived weeks upon milkweed and nothing else, not even salt to put in it, and I have gone from house to house and begged my bread, and nothing on my body but low pantaloons and a low shirt, and no one catched me murmuring. I am comfortable since the Lord made me life in this valley. This year and last year I have had the privilege of eating fruit off my own fruit trees, trees of my own planting. I have had the privilege in part of setting down under my own vine and fig tree. I never before in my life have had the privilege of setting out any kind of tree and eating the fruit of it until I came to this valley. I have a specimen with me of the fruit I have raised. Here are two plums I have taken from my trees, exhibited two fine plums. I have plucked plums from my trees three years in this valley, and some have got peaches enough to pay tithing on their fruit. I have eaten grapes of a large size and excellent flavor this year that was plucked from a vine that grew in this valley. Have I not reason to rejoice? Brethren, I would like to live in this valley so long the Lord shall say to us, Go back to headquarters, or to Jackson County. This is headquarters until we go there. I would like to live here. Can I do it? Yes, upon certain conditions, and that is to do right and listen to the counsel of Brother Brigham and his brethren that are associated with him, whom God has given to you to be your servants. He has given these men to you for this purpose, and if you do not believe it, go and read the book of Doctrine and Covenants. Can we tell you how to be saved and lead you into the celestial world? Yes, every one of you, and you cannot go there unless you do as you are told, unless you learn to be one. And then is there any power that can affect us? No. The devil has nothing to do with us. I have turned away from him, and left his kingdom, and joined myself to the kingdom of God, and acknowledged him to be my Father and my God, and his Son Jesus Christ to be my Savior. He is my God and my lawgiver. And I listen to the man he has appointed to lead us here in the flesh. We have got to learn from his instructions and be guided by his counsels, and by the counsels of those appointed by him to transact the matters and business pertaining to this people not only here in the valleys of the mountains, but throughout the whole world. This people are the pride of my heart. Mormonism is the pride of my life. It is my love, my jewel, and my darling, is this people, and this gospel, and plan of salvation. 
My heart is on that, and on the Almighty, and those who are delegated by Him to roll on to this work. As to your troubles and trials and crosses you have to carry about with you every day, I suppose you have to say, Well, I must take up my cross and travel on, though I have got a monstrous heavy one. When the law is given, and the principles of salvation revealed to the people for their protection and salvation, there is nothing that grieves me more than to see them heedless to observe and slow to obey the commandment of the Lord. In the different settlements the people have been instructed to build fortifications, and there is scarcely a man to lift a hand in this work marked out by us, and wish to God that we could, and listen to the counsel. You will see but little trouble in the flesh, but little poverty or trials. But I am as well aware, as I am that the sun ever rose and set, that there is not a man or woman in this church but will see sorrow. I can promise you that. You will see sorrow, and not one of you will escape it. Brother Joseph Smith, and from him down through the ranks of faithful elders that have passed through sorrow, mobbing, plundering, death, imprisonment, hunger, starvation, and some of them have been obliged to eat human flesh and dead dogs and cowhides. You that have come in from different countries and nations who have been helped here have had plenty of bread, the staff of life, to exist upon on your journey. And when there was a scarcity in your camps, flour has been sent out to you so that you have passed through comparatively comfortable and brought into a land of plenty. Learn to be satisfied with your blessings, and then you will not have trials. The first elders of this church had to bear the heat and burden of the day, but you expect to pass along on flowery beds of ease, comparatively speaking. If you do not feel the rod, it is because it don't come upon you, and if it does not come upon you, it will be because you repent of your sins and reform and pursue the straight path that leads to life and walk in the precepts given to you day by day by President Young or those he has delegated. It is all the same. And his voice is the voice of God to you, for God says, whether it is by my own voice or by the or that of my servants, it is all the same. O oh, brethren, do realize it, reflect, and keep your covenants and walk in the paths of salvation. There may be many who think I am severe in my conversation or in my instructions and remarks. I am not one half so severe as the Spirit of God in me. If I were to yield to it, neither is President Young in his remarks. You have got to come to the light that your sins may be reproved, that you may be set in the way of life and salvation. I know you desire it. You have come here for that purpose, that your sins may be reproved, your minds enlightened, and that you may walk in the path God Almighty has marked out for your feet. I have no other desire myself. I wish only to do right, and keep the commandments of God, and be a comfort to my brethren, and be a comfort to Brother Brigham. What I have said a thousand times I say it now, and... The love I have for that man, and for many others of my brethren, supersedes any love I ever had for a woman upon this earth. That is saying considerable. But I say it boldly before God and angels. My love for them is of a different nature, of a more tangible kind, and more lasting. It is not necessary for any person to be jealous of me because I love Brother Brigham better than anyone else. Voice in the stand. He is the same snap himself. And Brother Brigham says he is the same snap himself, and I will say, so are a great many more besides. All these sayings are good in their time and in their season. God says he has created everything in its time and season to be used with thanksgiving. Everything that God has created in heaven and on earth is made for the use of man, to be used with thanksgiving and praise to God. May God bless you, brethren, and comfort your hearts. My feelings are just as good towards you as yours can possibly be towards me. I have lived twenty years among this people, and traveled through the earth with Brother Brigham, and have preached the gospel, and opened the door of salvation. Did we go as elders now go? No, they go now upon flowery beds of ease to the nations, to preach the gospel, and there is always somebody to nourish and cherish them. When we went without person's scrip, we went hungry, and we were turned out of doors. When we were so sick that we could not, with comfort, sit up, the next the last time we went to England, when we started from our homes, I never saw a sick person in this valley that looked more feeble than either of us. We were feeble and naked and destitute of the common comforts of life. Here is Brother Taylor and several others of the old twelve who traveled barefooted, with nothing to eat and destitute. We used to travel forty miles a day, with a valise on our backs and our feet covered with blood, or the blood squashing in our boots and shoes. In this way, Brother Joseph traveled, and Brother Brigham, and Heber, and Parley, and thousands of others. 
Now the brethren that go to the nations are gallanted from city to city in fine coaches and railway cars. The only time I ever rode in a carriage was from Liverpool to Preston. We used to travel it on foot. Many of the elders that go out now are, are in wonderful affliction, for fear their families would not be provided for in their absence. When was the time that our families were provided for in our absence? But on the other hand, if they had a cow or a coat, it was taken from them. Brother Brigham left his family sick, and not one of them could help themselves when he was gone. A good brother took his last cow, and they took our clothing, and never provided one dime for the support of our families when we were sick and afflicted. Did we take money from home? No, neither did we take clothing, for we had none to cover us. When Brother Brigham and myself left our families to go to England, we were sick and shaking with the fever and ague, so that it was as much as we could do to lift a small trunk into the wagon. Have you come under such circumstances? You that may have not seen it yet, or I am much mistaken, you will never know how to sit down and meditate upon these things with us, and with the old apostles and prophets, except you pass through something of the same kind. Was it any sacrifice to us? No, not at all. When Brother Brigham and I left, the brethren were sick and dying, so much so that there were but few able to, to bury the dead. His wife came with me to my house. He fainted on the way, and fell down by the side of a tree. His wife came up to take care of him till we got ready, and was placed in the wagon, and bid farewell to our families and friends. I felt so bad I did not know what to do. My heart almost melted within me, but I said, Tears, stay where you belong and said to Brother Brigham, This is almost too hard. The wagon started, and Valate, my wife, was standing at the door, and instead of crying, we took off our hats, and shouted with all our might, Hurrah! Hurrah! And so we left, sick, nigh unto death at the same time. These are some of the joys and pleasures experienced by the first elders at the commencement of this work. I am only telling a small portion of our experience at this time. Much more remains untold and you expect to pass through on flowery beds of ease. We have had to build cities from the commencement of Mormonism to this time. We have never stopped in any place a few weeks without commencing to build houses, and make a place for the reception of those that followed in our trail. We have built cities all along our track from Missouri to this place, and we shall build cities back again. Okay. We have not got through this world yet by any means. You have got to be so subject to the master potter as to be put upon the wheel and turned into a vessel without finding fault about it. Oh, well, says you, I am willing to be handled by the Lord, but not by you. You can please yourself. I am a potter, and Brother Brigham is a potter, and we understand the business. He is the master potter on the earth, and I am one of his brethren, a servant potter, to mold vessels according to the pattern he gives me. I will do my best with a lump of clay, but if it becomes snappish and mars in my hands, all that is left for me to do, then, is to cut it off the wheel and throw it into the mill to be ground until it becomes passive. You have to be just as passive as clay in the hands of the potter if you wish to obtain eternal life. It is not trouble for the potter to take a thousand balls of clay and make as many vessels of them, and make them to perfection, if the clay is only passive. Can Brother Brigham bring this people into shape according to the order of God, if they will not listen to his counsel? You know it is impossible as well as I do. Reflect upon it. And go now with your mites, and do all you can for the cause of God. Bring in clothing, and stock, and this, that, and the other, for the gathering of the poor from the nations of the earth. Do not wait until your hearts are closed up, but always bond in the first good impression. The sisters may feel their hearts now to go home and give that coverlet, or anything else that is not in immediate use, and is not particularly wanted, which is a good impression. But if you do not feel so tomorrow, you will not do it. You must do the good you feel to do now. And let us lay hold and be of one heart and mind in these things. This perpetual fund is one of the greatest things that was ever instituted for the gathering of Israel, and it will do it, but you have got to lend a helping hand, every one of you, with your substance, your gold and silver, and those things the Lord has given to you that you have not any immediate use for. As for getting rich, good heavens, the riches of this world are not riches but in name. They are not riches to me. The more you have got of it, the more you have to you have to try you. Riches are a perfect perplexity to man. I mean the things of this earth, for it must all turn back to its mother earth. Now, brethren, whether my remarks are good remarks or not, I will make them as a good intention. They are intended for good, and you receive them, and treasure them up in your hearts. They will do you good. As for trials, Brother Brigham says, you shall have all you want of them. And as for sacrifices, I know of none. 
You have not walked alongside the, of the prophet Joseph when we heard his voice telling us to go here or go there. We never tarried for wives or children, for fathers or mothers, houses, lands, or anything else, but we left them where they were, and away we went. This is the way that Brother Brigham, myself, and many others have done. We never hesitated for a moment. If I should hesitate doing anything the Lord God wants me to do, I must change from the course I have pursued all my days. If there is a danger of me changing, there is also a danger that you will change. But my prayer is that I may be true to my brethren, that my brethren may be true to the cause of truth, to the church and kingdom of God, true to his angels and true to themselves, and that they can be associates by day, by night and by day, and when I call upon his name, he may hear me and answer my petitions before I rise from my knees. Brethren, would you not like to enjoy these things? There is not one of you but can reform and take a new start, reforming in all things that are required to do, and may God bless you, and be with you, and prosper you in righteousness and in truth for ever and ever. Amen.